All right. I think we are in business now. Okay, I'm just going to go over there, close the door, and come back, and, uh, and we'll start. Whew. And one thing I wanted to ask from Seneca students the next time that when we are coming in, and please, if possible, we all get close to each other. So when the questions are asked, your, your uh, audio is going to be heard better by the people that are there. But not today, but we're going to do it later. So try to, try to sit on these computers, not the outside ones. All right? OK, so uh, we are going to. Uh, Today we're going to actually go through all the concepts of week one. And uh, so the quiz for next week that we are going to get will be, if we look at the timeline, it's going to be on computers, information, and compilers, these three concepts. Okay, and the first day that you're coming in is going to be Tuesday. That's when we're going to have the quiz at the beginning of the class. Um, I will explain how the quizzes are done, uh, but before that I have to ask the uh, the uh, Canada students, um, I see everybody's over there is, uh, uh, most of you over there online. Uh, I, I would uh, like, uh, I see Brandon, I see um, Alex, I see uh, Benjamin. Uh, let me see who else is there. I'm just going to. That's perfect. Wow, lots of people are there. Good. So uh, if you have questions, uh, instead of talking into the microphone, I'm talking to people in Canada. I think uh, the best way is to um, type it in the, uh, in the chat so I can see what the question is and then tell me far out, take a look at the question. Like that, I won't have to ask you, what did you say, what did you say? Or if I ask a question and you want to reply to it, I think the best is to actually put it in a chat so I can see it over here like this. We're not going to have to. Um, do much of uh, back and forth uh, uh, acknowledgement thingies. Okay, so um, one question I have from Canada students, uh, have any of you uh, tried to, uh, do you know what Matrix is? I mean, like, did you log into Matrix ever to see what it is? Anyone from Canada? No. Okay, okay, good. So. Um, Okay, no problem. Um, I'm going to demonstrate right now what Matrix is and how to log into it. And um, um, for those who have computers over there, uh, you can actually uh, do this, one of you. Uh, any of you have a Telnet client on your computer in Canada? If you don't know what I'm talking about, that's very fine. Okay, so I'm going to actually tell you what a Telnet client is. Um, uh, over here in Seneca, if you go to your uh, My Apps and search for this, so essentially what you need to search for will be uh, a software called Putty. And let me actually open a Word client so I can actually um, type things for you to be able to see. So we are looking for we are looking for a software called Putty, okay? P-U-T-T-Y. And for people in Canada, you can simply Google this, and as soon as you Google this, you will see that a download page before it will come up. Let me just demonstrate. So if you type Putty, the very first thing is going to be download Putty, a free SSH Telnet client for Windows. Okay? And you click on that, and the first thing that you see over here, you can download Putty here. Okay? Click over there, and it tells you which versions you have. If 99%, you have a 64 bit Windows installed on your computer. If you, do, if you don't know what is the version of Windows that you have, you can simply open on your file explorer, right click on this PC, and click on properties. And what comes up over here, it tells you that the system type is 64-bit operating system, yada, yada. So it tells you actually what is the type of the uh, 
um, operating system that you have. So you select the proper one and then if it's a 64-bit, you sim simply click on this one and an installer comes up and you install it and you're going to have PuTTY on your, on your computers. Again, uh, it was just the uh, session that we had yesterday and because of that fact, I did not have time to prepare all the videos and upload it. But I will upload all these things one by one. So, and not to forget, I'm going to actually mention over here the uh, instruction video on PuTTY, instruction video, instructions for PuTTY and matrix. So I'm going to put the videos up for that. So after you click this, you're going to have a software on your computer called PuTTY, which is, if I go like this, that is going to be it. And over here in my apps, you can open it and bring up PuTTY. As soon as you do this, you can, for host name over here, you have to type matrix.senecacollege.com. Dot CA. So again, it is matrix.senecacollege.ca. Doing that, you click on open, and it is going to come up with uh, a screen like this. Okay? Now, um, it's, it's going to say login as. And then you have to put your Seneca user ID in there, the one that you log in into Blackboard with. And then it's going to ask for your password. And doing so, you should be able to log into Matrix. If not, please let me know so I can talk to the people who are supposed to set it up. And, uh, and uh, we'll find out uh, uh, how things are going to work out. So again, when we go on PuTTY, this is what's going to happen. Let me just try it one more time. So again, it's going to ask for password. You put the password that you have for Seneca, and you log into PuTTY. And to clear the string, just type clear. OK? Did anybody in Canada try to do this uh, successfully, hopefully, or not? Anyone? Anyways, if you see you cannot log into Matrix, let me know. So uh, then I can actually ask them to activate your account on Matrix. I'm going to just uh, get the list of all the students that I have in IPC, and I'm going to say I cannot type anything in. You cannot type anything in your... Uh, in your uh, uh, in the party? Oh, access denied. No problem. Good. So now that I know it's access denied, I'll take care of it. Don't worry. I'll, uh, um, I'll talk to them. That's very fine. No, it's, it's not that you cannot type in anything. So you type your user ID, and then you cannot type your password. OK, let me tell you exactly what happened. Felix, uh, thank you very much. That was a perfect response. I, I, I needed to know that. Now, take a look at me when I do this. Uh, I'm going to log off. And I'm going to log back in. And I'll explain exactly. It was my bad. I have to explain exactly what happens. OK, so when you log in, you enter your user ID, you can actually see your user ID being typed. But when you want to type your password, it doesn't show anything because it is your password. So uh, what happens is that you type, but nothing comes up on a screen. And then you hit enter if your password is wrong. So I'm going to type something wrong now. I typed, but as you see, nothing was on a screen. Now I hit enter. It's going to tell me access denied, as you did. But again, I tried this time. I'm going to type the proper password. And I hit Enter. Now I get it. So when you are typing the password, nothing's going to show up on a screen because it's your password and nobody's supposed to see it. If you type your user ID and you can see it, that's fine. Uh, but the password, you will, it, it's not going to be echoed back, so you won't be able to see it. 
But again, anyways, try to log in. And if anybody could log in, fine. If you cannot, uh, I will activate your account. I'm going to ask to activate your account, and you're going to get the instructional videos on that and everything. All right, so yeah, so this is, uh, uh, the matrix is imperative. You need to have this one because you submit all your work on matrix. So it is important for you to have this account. And I'm going to uh, uh, activate all the accounts and make sure everything's okay. All right, so having said that, uh, if there is uh, no questions at this point, I'm going to start the, the lecture. Any questions? Anyone? All right. So we are going to talk about, first of all, computers. Um, when we talk about computers, um, uh, first of all, let me just uh, make sure that everything's OK. You can hear me in Canada. Somebody can type a yes or whether in the chat line so I can see, so I can make sure that you have my voice. Perfect. Fantastic. All right. So when we are talking about a computer, essentially, when we are talking about a computer, uh, we don't really, uh, when we talk about a computer, we don't really uh, uh, can specifically tell what type of computer we are talking about. Think about it for a second. There are things over th uh, in the world that are considered to be computers that we could not even imagine. Why? Let's look at this. If we have, if we have a cell phone in our hand, if we have a cell phone in our hand, essentially we have one of the most sophisticated computers that exist right now on planet Earth. Your cell phone is much more sophisticated than any computer that you have in your hand. Why? Because it's so much compact. Why? Because it has probably 8 to 16 CPUs that you're not aware of. Why? Because it has memory that's probably more than the computer that you have at home. Why? Because it's always connected to internet. So it has lots of amazing features that you cannot have on your laptop. So be always remember, things, the computer that we are talking about, can be anything. The remote control that you use for your TV, that's a computer. The keyboard itself, like the keyboard, the separate, the keyboard that you have, this keyboard that you type stuff on, it's a separate computer of its own and you get that computer and connect it to your big computer, and this provides the uh, capability of you being able to send text to your computer. Okay? So again, computers are very uh, uh, vast domain of what we live in right now. They dominate that literally. What do we use? What we are going to use are regular computers that are, uh, their job is to uh, be a, a, a literal computer, not a remote control that has a computer inside. The computers that we have, they have an input, they have an output, they have a processing unit. Now, when we are talking about processing unit, the processing unit of a computer in our uh, uh, perspective is that big box that comes with the monitor. But that's not the case. Inside your computer, there are so many different parts, and the processing unit is just a little tiny piece of chip, size of your fingernail, that is installed on the motherboard, big board of your computer, that it has a big fan over it. If one day you open up your computer and take a look inside. Your laptop, you can't do it because it's much more compressed and difficult to open, but hopefully you're going to be able to do those, go do those things soon. Every single computer that we do accepts instructions from us, process those instructions, and do some action for us. For example, I forgot to put my cell phone on mute, so I'm going to actually do it right now, and at the same time, be able to... All right. 
So your cell phone, OK? Let me just see. Right now, I'm going on my cell phone. I am trying to log into my cell phone. It asks for my pattern, the thing that you do. That was an input. It went to the cell phone. Cell phone processes it and granted me accent. I want to mute the cell phone. I put the click on the mute button and it gets muted. If I want to call somebody, I dial. So how do I enter? I put a few marks, a few numbers over there and I hit on dial and the telephone call is made. So lots of action is happening. Input, process, output. Input, process, output. Input is the phone number. I'll, di I'll dial. I issue the enter command and it goes into the computer. The computer processes the action of phone calling and then it gives you the output of actual phone call that you can talk to your mom. All right? So that's the process that happens every single time over and over and over. Each computer has a device installed in, inside that is called memory. The memory inside your computer, you have heard about it, like how big, you, they're saying, how big is your RAM? It means how much random access memory, how much memory your computer have. The bigger the memory of the computer is, the bigger chunk of information can be kept into the computer. Therefore, your computer runs smoother. Therefore, it's going to be seen to be faster. So lots of people, when you're going out to buy a computer, you say, OK, I want a faster CPU. If you buy the fastest CPU, but your memory, the memory of the computer is not big enough, that CPU doesn't have big enough playground to play in. Therefore, it's not going to be fast. So it's always a balance. If you have a weak CPU, and then the biggest thing that you can get for your RAM, for your computer to be as fast as it can, is 8 gigs, for example. If you make it 16, it won't make, it make any difference. So it's always a balance between the two. How fast my computer can process, how much memory I should provide for that processor so it can do the things faster. OK? So that's all the things that you need to know. Now, each CPU has two type of memory inside. One is called uh, each processing th uh, unit has two type of memory inside. One is called read-only memory, and the other one is called uh, random access memory. Read-only memory are the program, the, the instructions inside your CPU that are imprinted and, and, and in, engraved into the CPU, and it can't change the language of the CPU, the program inside the CPU. If you want to change that, you have to change your CPU. You have an i5, you don't want it, you change it with an i7. So you change the whole thing. You cannot change the program inside the CPU. That's called ROM, read-only memory. RAM, that stands for random access memory, is not like that. It's a piece of memory in which you can write different instructions, wipe it out, and write new instructions. Wipe it out and write your new instructions. So that's what uh, uh, read-only memory and random access memory stand for. Um, when we are dealing with, when we are dealing with uh, memory, this is not something that I have. Uh, that, that I want to uh, 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 talk too much about. We just, we just need to understand what does it mean. When we, uh, what, what does it mean when we say memory? A memory inside the computer can be of many different types. Um, memory is a storage. It's something that you put instructions in. We can give a beautiful example that relates exactly to what it is, uh, what the memory is with, uh, say, a bucket and a water. Let's say you want to get some water from a lake. What can you do? Can you move the lake? No. Lake is a huge, huge, huge memory that has lots of water in it. If you want to carry that water out, maybe you want to get a barrel and fill the barrel with water. So you can slowly move that barrel towards your cottage or whatever. Now, if you want to get water out of that barrel, you have to use a bucket. A bucket is smaller, 
holds less memory in it, holds less water, but you can move faster with it. But still you can't go move faster. If you actually want to go hiking, you have to have a bottle and fill that bottle with the water and put it in your backpack. Now you can run. That's the exact same thing with memory. When you have a hard disk, disk, it's a gigantic piece of memory, but it's not as fast. If you want to run faster, if you want to get information faster, you have to get that information out of the hard disk and put it inside RAM. RAM is smaller, it cannot hold as much, but it's faster. But still, RAM is not fast enough for processing units speed of thinking. For that, processing unit, the CPU, the central processing unit, has only around 16 small pieces of, of, of memory that are called registers. They are lightning fast, literally. Speed of light, speed of electricity. They are extremely fast. They are faster thing that you can imagine. But because they are so fast, they are so small. So we talked about bytes last time. As we said, byte is essentially one piece of, uh, uh, of memory. Did we talk about bytes in, in, in this class yesterday? Or it was the other class and I'm just mixing the thing? Did I talk about bytes and bits? No, I did not. So let's talk about it. Uh, anyways, uh, the, the, these registers are memories that are very, very small, but they are extremely fast. So uh, the chunks of RAM that has uh, information in it uh, are picked up and put into registers so the CPU can process them. And that's how the computer works. Big information goes into smaller and the smaller pieces until it's fast enough and small enough that can be fed into, fed into central processing unit. Now, uh, it, in here, as you see, it actually shows how, see, how fast is a register. Register can be read in 10 nanoseconds. RAM is 60 nanoseconds, and then you go to hard disk, just take a look how slow the hard disk is. Okay? So, that's the, uh, so but, the, but registers are very small, RAMs are a little bigger, and hard disks are, hard disks are huge. Now, software. What is a software? Software is essentially the group of, now, let's uh, take a look at software. What is software? Software is essentially, software is essentially, uh, a package of instructions that are put together for a specific purpose and it's made ready that can be fed directly into CPU. Now depending on how complex the software is, it could be bigger or smaller. Who feeds the software to the CPU? It's the operating system. Okay? When we are dealing with computer science, essentially We go into the uh, uh, analogy of chicken and the egg. Which one came first? Okay. Um, when I talk about a software, I will say software is a program that is ran by operating system, and operating system feeds it to the CPU. But then you think about the operating system. Operating system is a software by itself whose job is to run other softwares. And that's when the confusion and paradox is going to come. Which one came first, the operating system or the software? But that's how it is. Essentially, uh, early computers were just programmed by wires, which means they literally had pieces of wire that they connected from one spot to another to make something happen. And then after that thing was done, they uh, put that software, saved it in a small thing, and used that software to make bigger softwares. And it kept going like that. And then, then now we have this uh, gigantic softwares that are created very, uh, uh, in a very complicated way. Anyways, let's, uh, let's pass through it. So the operating system is the, uh, the main program that runs the whole computer. And the softwares that you create is going to be kept on the permanent storage of a computer, which is a hard disk. 
and you ask the operating system to take the software out of the hard disk and put it in RAM so the CPU can read it register by register and execute it. So that's the process of things. So essentially, when you go on your uh, uh, um, desktop and you double click on uh, an icon and you say, I want that icon to be open. So if you double click on that one, you essentially asking the operating system to go get the software Chrome browser from the hard drive, bring it to the uh, RAM, and feed it to the CPU so CPU can run and show far that schedule. Okay? So it's the operating system that does everything, and it's the master of the, uh, of the computer. Uh, now, having said that, let's go to the next uh, part of what we are going to talk about. Software is essentially nothing but, uh, first of all, any questions down to here on the, on the things that I talked about, about computers and storage in a computer? All right, so um, information. Software is a package, series of instructions that's written and, and the computer executes them. Instructions are written in some kind of a language. That language is made up of Letters, grammar, syntax. Those small letters and things that build up the language are information that we need to keep on a computer. So we have to somehow represent information inside uh, a computer. Now, uh, Am I at the right place? Let me see. Uh, oh, I, I'm at the right. Let me just put the uh, the what the uh, okay. I think I'm on the wrong side. So let me go. I'm trying to find out which one is what. So that's left whiteboard. Also, oh, that's so that's the other. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. There you go. Now I'm on a whiteboard. So. Hopefully, you will be able to see the whiteboard when I'm writing on it, okay? All right, so uh, uh, can I get a thumbs up from people in Canada if you're actually seeing the, the, the thing? Oh, perfect. All right, good. Wow, everybody. Okay, goody, goody. Thank you. Now, um, when we are dealing with information, the only way the information can be actually that can be actually kept inside a computer, the only way you can actually keep information inside a computer, it is using a switch. That's the only way a computer can keep information in it. You know what does it mean? Let's say I'm telling you, if you're coming to my office, if the light is on, I'm in. If the light is off, it means I'm not in. Right? So I used one switch to tell you if I'm inside the office or I'm not. As simple as that. That's how computers work. They have switches, small little tiny switches that are off and on, and this tells yes or no. OK or not OK. Green or yellow. Sour or bitter. Day or night, or zero or one, okay? So you can indicate with this switch whatever you want to indicate. But in computers, to be able to simulate this indications, we need two states, zero or one. So I will say zero means light off, means I'm not at, in the office. One means light on, it means I'm in the office.
So you need to tag information with these switches. A switch can show only two states and two states only. It, it cannot show anything else. You cannot say zero or one and that's it. It's, it's only two ways on or off, right? So they said it's not enough. If I have one switch, I can only show a zero or a one. And that's it. So zero, one, only two different ways of showing this. What if I have two switches? If I have two, so, so one switch is zero or one. Now, two switches, two switches, how they're going to be? How many different things? Both zero, one, zero, one, the other one zero and the other one one or both one. How many different positions? One, two, three, four. Correct? So with two switches, I can show four different possibilities, which means it's going to look like this. Zero, 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 one, one, zero. <laughs> I put the thing on. And one, one. Are we okay with this? So I can show four different situations, four different states with two switches. What if I make it three switches? How many then? How many? Can anybody tell? Seriously? Silence? Completely? Okay, it's eight. All right? How does it work? Look at this. One, two, three, four, and then I'm going to go zero, zero, one, one, and zero, one, zero, one. Take a look. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. How many different positions? Eight, correct? Now, what if I want to have more? I only am showing eight different positions, right? Eight, eight different states. If I want to, actually tag if I so if I look at this if I keep going and say I want to make the switches four if I make the switches four these are a little too big let me just make it smaller so I can put everything in here and I hope it's good so I want to see how high I can put it so I can see down here okay good so it's one two three four five six seven eight one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Three, four. Zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero. Zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, one. And then zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. Zero, one. If I have four switches, I can have 16 different positions. These 16 different positions are tagged, are named as follows, so we can refer to them easily. First one, zero, then one, then two, then three, four, five, six. Too big, I'm writing. One more time. Zero. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I cannot write ten because I only want one symbol for it. So they said ten is one and zero. It's two symbols. That's not going to work out. I want one symbol. So they go A, B, C, D, E, and F. As a result, the hexadecimal numbering came out to be. So this was binary, which means 0 and 1. Hexadecimal is essentially 0 up to 15, which means 16 different states, right? So that's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to F, and that becomes 16, right? Now, let's do the math. If I wanted to have 16 different positions, I am using four bits. What if I want to tag the English alphabet? How many letters we have in English alphabet? 
26, right? So if I make it 5 bits, how many different positions? It's 2 to the power of 5. It's 2 to the power of 4, that is 16. 2 to the power of 5, that's 32. So that's good enough. But what if I want uppercase and lowercase? So let's make it 6 bits. That will be 2 to the power of 6. That's how many? 64. That looks fine. But well, wait a minute. What if I want punctuation? Curly brackets and things like that. So we make it 7. If we make it 7, it's 128 different positions. Correct? Therefore, that's enough. So if I actually put three more digits, 1, 2, 3, if I do that, then I'm going to have 128. But this is not symmetric when you think about it. If I actually write 7 bits, so that's 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, let's say something like this. That's 7. Which one is middle? I mean, like, this is the right side, that this is, it doesn't work. It's not good, right? So they made it 8, all right? Which means two fours. First of all, when it's two fours, it's very easy to be uh, shown with that single hexadecimal digit. So I can write over here, for example, this is, if I write a value for a bit like this, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, something, whatever. If I look at it, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0 is 6, so this is 6, and 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0 is E. So I can write 6E. When I write 6E, it means that bit pattern. So I can actually write what is inside these 8 bits. So they said, that's a good unit. That's a unit that can show a character inside a computer. Let's keep it. They call that a, what do they call it? A byte. That became a byte. So each byte has eight bits in it. And when you say my computer has 16 gigabytes of RAM, it means you can hold 16 billion of these characters inside. OK? That's what it is. And that's how the information is kept inside your computer. Each byte is one unit of memory. And the definition of byte is that a byte is the smallest addressable piece of memory. What does it mean? It means you can actually count. You can actually, you can actually, you can actually write uh, uh, look for, I don't know, byte number 952. You can actually count and see what's inside byte number 562. But bits are not accessible. These little ones, they are called bits. You cannot see what is the 9,000th bit in memory. There is no such thing. That's why when they ask you about the definition, that's the quiz, quiz question for the next day that you're coming in. What is the smallest addressable unit of memory? That's a byte. What is the smallest unit of memory? That's a bit. The difference between bit and a byte is that a byte is addressable. You can go to it and find out what's inside. A bit is not accessible. It's inside a byte. To see what is a state of a bit, you have to play tricks. That we're not going to do it now. When you pass four uh, semesters, you can get data structures and, and assembly language, then you're going to know how. For now, we don't need to know. Okay? So now we know what is the smallest unit of memory and how information is kept inside, uh, inside a, a computer. Uh, as I mentioned, like how hexadecimal values are set, these are all done. Uh, now, when you actually get RAM for your computer, you get several different chip, chips, cards. Like you can install four modules of RAM in your computer. What happens is that computer puts them all back to back together and converts it to a single chain of bytes. So <clears throat> this is very important and imperative for you to know that memory in your computer, and this is something that you need in IPC 144 to understand. The memory inside your computer 
is a chain of byte, a single chain of byte that you can count from the beginning. It starts from byte number zero and goes up to what? The amount of money that you have in your pocket, which means how much RAM you can buy for your computer. Okay, the bigger the RAM is, the bigger the number of the bytes are. And this sequence number of the byte, I want your, uh, uh, or your, your hearing ears on. This is very important. This sequence number of bytes, byte number 32, byte number 54, byte number 9 billion, 600, whatever, biggest number that you can think. This sequence number is called the ad address of certain byte in memory. So if somebody tells you what is the address of this byte, it means what is the sequence number of the byte in the memory. So if I told you this is the 15th byte in memory, it means the address of this byte is 15. Okay? So when you hear address, it doesn't mean 32 Bathurst Street. It means a sequence number of a byte in your memory. Capisce? We understand this? All right? Are you okay? Can I get a thumbs up from the people in Canada if you understand this? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Good, good. So this is what we need to know. Uh, and because all the, all the uh, dealings that are, we are doing in, 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 base, uh, in base 2, it's in binary language, <coughs> unlike real life, kilo, mega, giga, tera, peta, and exa are not coefficients of 1,000. When you say 1 kilobyte, it doesn't mean 1,000 bytes. It means 2 to power 20, 2 to, it means 1024, that is essentially uh, 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 anything that you do is a coefficient of 1024, okay? It's not a thousand, okay? So when you are saying, I don't know, one megabyte is essentially means uh, 1024 multiplied by 1024 bytes, okay? Um, that's why the numbers that you get for your hard drives, when they say this hard drive is 50 gigabytes, when you actually look at it, it's not, uh, it's not a round number. It has bits and pieces. It's because a thousand, a kilo, in computer science is 1024, okay? Remember that. All right. Segmentation fault, way too early. I don't want anybody to read this now, okay? Don't, and there's not, not gonna be any questions about segmentation fault. That's way too off for us to know what's going on. Essentially, essentially, let me just tell, tell you a quick explanation of what a segmentation fault is, um, and you listen to it and try to kind of understand it. If you don't, then fine. When you are writing programs, a uh, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, programs used to be written as a single thing that, is, that has driven the computer, which means when you ran a program in your computer, no other program would run. That's old times. You had an operating system, then you ran a program, you ran a game. Then the operating system with, will execute the game, so you will see the game is running, but uh, the operating system will go away, would not be present. Your program runs, your game runs, and when it finished, the operating system would come back on. It was a single driven thing. These days, that's not the case. Your CPUs are so powerful that they can run 50,000 things at the same time. And that's why you have a browser open at the same time a, a music is playing, and at, this, at the same time, I don't know, you do 50,000 different things in a computer at the same time. Now, because of this fact, each program is, that is running is given a piece of memory to work with. For example, you're not a program, operating system says, John, you wrote a program. Your program is supposed to run from this address to that address in memory. It should not go beyond and before. If your program tries to go out of its own segment, if your program does something that goes out of the segment that the operating system gave it to work with, you will get a segmentation fault and your program dies. Okay? That's what a segmentation fault is, but you will see it later on. 
as soon as you deal with it. But this is too early for us. I just told you what does it mean. So essentially, if you go out of your territory with a program, you get a segmentation fault. It means you went out of your memory. That's not your memory. Don't poke your nose in other people's memory. Okay? What, does, what, what do viruses and hackers do? They go over segmentation faults and screw around people's programs, and that's how they work. Anyways, uh, we are okay down to here? Okay? All right. I, I, uh, uh, my brain works much faster than my tongue, so I speak sometimes a little too fast, and I mumble, and I say things that people don't understand. Please stop me. And people in Canada shout and say, slow down, so, so I don't talk too fast. My apologies if I do that. Uh, <laughs> OK, I'll do that. Anyways, so uh, next thing that we need to talk about, compilers. Compilers. Compilers, compilers. <clears throat> what are compilers? CPU understands, CPU understands only, CPU understands only machine language. CPU understands only zeros and ones. So essentially, if you want to write a program, you have to write it in zeros and ones, which is absolutely impossible. When a CPU is <clears throat> doing something, remember that I told you that we can tag the stuff, though. So I actually said that when you are writing a, a piece of code, when, you, when, when they designed the computer, they had zeros and ones. So they tagged every single thing, every single uh, character with a number. OK? <clears throat> that number is a combination of zeros and ones. When we put four of them together, we could go from 0 up to 15, right? OK, when you put. Uh, Eight of them together, you go from 0 up to 256, right? And that's one byte. Now, the combination of these values together in a CPU means something. So a pattern of bits like 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1 0, 0, 1, 1, 0 means add. <laughs> oh, that's not add, that's ab, add, OK? So something like that. Can anybody remember that? No, I just made it up. It's not, <laughs> there's no such thing, but it's something like that. And when you do that add, then you have to put two numbers in binary in two registers of CPU. So CPU adds them up and puts the result in another register. And that's how an addition is happening. Because they could not remember what they are, they put abbreviations, they put, <clears throat> they put uh, tags for that. So when they said add, it means this. This is machine, so, and they said 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, whatever, that means subtract, okay? And then another 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, something like that, that means jump, okay? So they wrote very small little things that corresponded, like they wrote kind of some kind of a dictionary. They said, whenever I wrote add, put this one instead. Whenever I put sub, put this one instead. Whenever I put jump, put this one instead. So they can write a program. This is machine language, okay? This is machine language, and this is called assembly language. OK? Assembly language and machine, machine language, they have a one-to-one -one relationship, which means one instruction of an assembly language is actually one instruction of machine code. Hackers, those people who write very low-level programs, use assembly. OK? If you want to write a program that adds two num um, if you want to write a program that reads something from the keyboard, reads two numbers from the keyboard, adds them up, and gives you the sum, you have to write probably 
I don't know, 3,000 lines of assembly code? Because input and output is a very difficult thing. Okay, so <clears throat> it's difficult, right? So what they did, they said, okay, to be able to read something, I need to write, what, 10,000 line of 300 lines of assembly code? I package those <clears throat> 3,000 lines of assembly code together. I package those 3,000 lines of assembly code together, and I call it print. So when you write print, it gets translated into 3,000 lines of assembly code. This is a high-level language. This is a low-level language. Now, languages, depending on how high-level and low-level are, they get translated into assembly language in different aspects. Like, there are languages that print is very shorter thing, and you have to do more to be able to print. There are languages that you just write one print, and it does everything for you. Those are called high-level languages. High-level languages are very close to human language, like language, uh, the language COBOL. COBOL is a, it's like you're talking to your grandma. Please add five to two. You write something like that. But assembly language is extremely low-level, which means you need to actually be a computer professional to understand what it is. So they, cried, uh, they, so they tried to create languages that stay halfway between. One of the most powerful languages in the world that is a middle-level language is C language. C language is not assembly, it's not COBOL, and it can act like both. That's why you can learn it as a high-level language, but later in process when you actually get professional, you can write programs as powerful as assembly code in C language. That's why all the languages right now that are very hot they are children of C language. They have the same syntax. Java, JavaScript, C Sharp, Objective-C. All these languages that you see, they come from C, uh, uh, that, you, that you see, they come from the C language, okay? Now, <clears throat> C language was very nice. It was written and it worked very well, uh, but it was structured in a way that we could not solve all the complex problems that we had. It was very difficult to organize it. That's why they added one feature to it. That feature is called object orientation that you're going to learn next semester. That language, that language is called C++. They called it C++ because it has one extra feature than this one. Okay? One extra feature than this one. We don't learn that yet, then that's why, but that's why when we are using Visual, Visual Studio, we use Visual C++ to compile our C code. Because C++ is daughter of C language, C is its mother, C++ knows all the tricks of C. So you can compile a C code with a C++ compiler, but reverse it's not possible. On Matrix, that is a much more old-fashioned system, you are actually using a C compiler to compile your code, which means you cannot write a C++, C++ program with it. It's actually a C compiler. On Windows machines that we are working, we are using Visual Studio. We don't, because uh, Visual C++ is a very complex program, it has C++ compiler, and that's why we are using that. Okay? So that's how languages work. Any questions? Suggestions, objections, no objections, all right, okay, I have to actually get a headset and put something on my ears to, to be able to hear people in Canada better, uh, and I have to talk to whoever is designing your stuff over there to uh, give you a microphone. Uh, you, need, you, need to have, you need to have something like this, a microphone that you can pass along and, and give it from one person to another so you can actually ask your questions and I can hear it properly. Or a microphone with better quality. Anyways, um, so we have no questions about languages. Now, 
the languages that we just talked about. Now, when you write a code in C language, this code must get translated into machine language, zeros and ones, before it can run. Correct? That program who does it is called a compiler. Compiler is a program that receives a, a language and the compiler is written specifically for, la for that language. So if you are writing a C program, you need a C compiler. If you are writing a COBOL program, you need a COBOL compiler. Okay? So you get, the, you get the compiler, you write your C program, you give it to the compiler. Compiler digests it, first checks for grammar errors to see if you wrote something nuts. If you see you wrote something nuts, you're going to say, hey, I don't understand what does it mean. Give me the right words. As soon as it checks all the grammar and makes sure everything is OK, it checks for basic logic facts to see if you have written the syntax properly. When you have written a command, the command has the proper notation for it. If that is OK, then it says it's OK. I can actually make this feedable for CPU. So it translates it into zeros and ones and saves it on a hard disk. Then it calls another program. That program is called Linker. Linker will get your zeros and ones, put them together, and makes it feedable to CPU. And that is called, ladies and gentlemen, an executable program that you run and you see it doesn't work properly. So you have to go back to step one and start writing again. Because you wrote the program improper, you write it again, you compile again, you run, it doesn't work. Go back. You write, you compile, you test, it doesn't work. You go back, you write, you compile, it works. Perfect. You give it to the client, and after a month and a half, they come to you and say something went wrong. You go find out what's going on, you write, you compile, you do it again. So that life cycle of writing, compiling, and the, that development cycle is an infinite loop that happens over and over and over. And that's all the updates that you are getting on your programs, on your machines, on your cell phones. An update is available. Why? Because something went wrong. Nobody can write a perfect program. It is absolutely impossible. No one can write a program that works perfectly. You can write a program that works properly and hopefully is not going to have as much problems. But if it does have a problem, then they're going to come back to you to fix it over and over and over and over. Are we okay with this? Are we okay? Thumbs up from Canador. Thank you, thank you. All right, perfect. All right, so now we have this. Uh, C compiler, yada, 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 examples. We have all those. It's 102. I did not give you guys a break. Let's go for a break and come back, and we're going to write our first C program and see how things are done. Uh, and uh, uh, so let's have, and please don't make the break too long. When I say five minutes, you usually disappear for 10. So let's make it around five minutes. We come back, and then we have another 20 minutes of me mumbling, and then we're going to go home and enjoy our lives. See you guys soon. Five minutes.